Yeah, well, I think that we can start. Uh, so, hello everybody. Thank you for uh, coming and choosing this presentation. We try to make it as, uh, as the best. So, my name is the Michal Jura. I'm a Linux uh, cloud developer and with me there is my, my colleague. Hi, hello. <coughs> I'm Flavio Castelli. I'm engineering manager for the containers team at SUSE. So, yeah, we would like to invite you for uh, our presentation. It's uh, called OpenStack and Magnum and Kubernetes for everyone. So, there are some challenges nowadays. Um, as you know, you have to uh, go through really rapid development cycles. You are using agile devel um, development metho methodologies. You are using continuous integration, continuous delivery, all of that to just react quickly to all the changes that you face uh, on a daily basis. To help yourself, you also rely on cloud environments to have the flexibility to scale out when you have these traffic peaks and to be everywhere by leveraging different data centers. But for all of that, there is a price. So you have to deal with uh, high complexity of the cloud environments. You have probably to deal also with different cloud providers, being them public or private one. You're trying to, to cope with that also by adopting microservices architecture. So you find yourself dealing with tons of containers and you need help to, to sort all that, okay? So what you want to do, no. Switch. No, no, no. Okay. What you want to do is to focus on the application that you are uh, developing, not on the machine. So you want to manage application, not manage <coughs> machines. To do that, you can <laughs> you can resort to Kubernetes. Kubernetes is an orchestration engine. We're going to <coughs> talk more about that now. It allows you to be portable. So once you package your application inside of uh, containers, you can move them really everywhere. They do not, uh, it doesn't force you to use certain directives in order to deploy and create your application. It is also friendly with uh, legacy applications, so applications that are not born uh, respecting the 12 uh, uh, factors application manifest. So it, it's really flexible. It avoids vendor locking because once you have Kubernetes, it doesn't really matter if it's Kubernetes running on top of an open cloud or on top of a private one or on, on bare metal. It allows you to focus just on, uh, on your application, as I said before. So it's uh, self-healing. If something fails, it will automatically recover. It can also be instructed to automatically scale. So if there is a, a peak of request, it can scale up and then when the, the peak is over, it can roll back so that you're not wasting resources. And the really nice thing is that once you try to run stuff inside of containers and deploy this distributed application, we'll start facing a lot of challenges. You will have a lot of problems to solve. Kubernetes has an opinion about how to solve these problems, but uh, despite being opinionated, it allows you to, to switch out of implementation details thanks to his plugin architecture that supports different types of drivers for the different types of problems that you are going to face. It, um, it allows you to solve stuff like persistent storage, which uh, despite everyone uh, speaking about stateless application, it's still a problem. You're still going to have stateful application and you still need to manage them. So Kubernetes can help with that, as it can help with secret management key certificates, uh, um, uh, credentials, and it can also uh, help you with doing deployments. We will see that later on. The architecture of Kubernetes is, is this one. You have a cluster of etcd nodes. Uh, etcd is a key value uh, database. It's a distributed one. It keeps the status of, of the cluster inside of it. You have one or more masters <coughs> which are interacting with etcd. On the master, you have the scheduler who figures out where a certain uh, workload has to be placed. You have the API server, which is the entry point for your clients, um, meaning for the operator to, to, manage, uh, to manage the cluster. You have the controller manager who is enforcing that the desired state, like I want to have five instances of a gas book container running, that at any time there are always five instances. So the controller manager make sure that the desired state matches with the reality. Then you have uh, a number of workers. On each worker, you are actually running the containers. The containers are grouped together into a pod, which is the smallest unit of Kubernetes. 
these containers are really uh, tied together. It's up to the designer to, to specify that these containers have to be co-located into a pod because by doing that you remove some isolation features of, of containers, but it's, it's done on design, by design. So the containers are created with a container engine like Docker or can be something else like Rocket or there, is, there are current efforts to use RunC to do that. This container engine is managed by Kubelet. Kubelet is a Kubernetes process which receives directives from the API server to perform the different operations. And then there is KubeProxy, who is in charge of uh, figuring out some details about the, Docker, uh, the Kubernetes networking. On a higher level, this is how the architecture looks like. So let's say that you have a Gasbook application which is running inside of a container. This is deployed on a Kubernetes cluster. So how do you expose that to, your, uh, to the internet? So the internet will uh, go through a set of load balancer, like traditional ones, and then this load balancer will redirect uh, the, the request to one of the worker nodes of your cluster. On each worker node, as you can see, there is a port number, uh, like 88 in this case. This is a port number which is common across all the workers and is specific to the Gasbook container. So the request goes to this port and then this is forwarded to one of these uh, containers. So how is uh, Kubernetes deployed? So what does it require? As I said before, it requires an etcd cluster. It requires one or more worker nodes. Uh, it requires one or more master nodes. There is a software-defined network which links all the containers together and you are going to need a load balancer to, to handle the ingress network. Plus, you will need a lot of uh, work to, to bring up everything together. Upstream is aware of this problem um, because they know that uh, it's really a pleasure to use Kubernetes as a user, to manage that as an operator, but they are aware that it's a pain to deploy it. So Kubernetes Upstream is currently working on a tool called Kube Admin which is a tool currently in beta stage, uh, introduced with 1.4, that makes the deployment easier. But it's not yet there. So in the meantime, what can we do, Mikhail? Yeah. <clears throat> I think that so we have to combine these two worlds. So we, from one side, we have the OpenStack world, which is the perfect infrastructure as a service uh, framework. And from the other side, we have the Kubernetes, which uh, is the uh, tool for scheduling applications. So we are thinking that this uh, is perfect solution for everyone. I mean, the OpenStack and the Kubernetes. And this can be brings to users uh, with the new OpenStack service called Magnum. This service was introduced uh, with the Liberty uh, uh, release and it's the um, containers as a service. Um, so it supports different uh, Linux images and integ integrates of course uh, the uh, different components like Kubernetes, Docker, Flanner and of course the open OpenStack services uh, Keystone, Glance and Cinder and etc. So OpenStack Magnum uh, is providing also a new API. It's uh, used for the, um, isolating the uh, container orchestration engines and it's a perfect management tool uh, for orchestrating the cloud resources and instances with HIT. So we can just clone, for example, our um, development uh, environment and have the same uh, network setup for uh, alpha, beta and production environments with this same network configuration. We can just launch different uh, Kubernetes clusters among the, among the different projects. And we will be talking only about the Kubernetes, but we st you can still use different uh, containers, uh, containers orchestration engines like Swarm or, or Mesos. And at the end, for example, when your uh, Kubernetes cluster will be uh, up and running, you can still communicate uh, with your uh, tools, which you know the best, uh, like Docker for uh, getting access to the containers or to the hosts, and uh, you can still use the um, Kubernetes client for creating the pods or replication controllers. How does it look like from the architecture point of view? 
so operator of OpenStack can access the um, Magnum API using the Magnum client. It can just send the request about creating the new object. So this uh, request will be passed to the Magnum conductor and the Magnum contact conductor will uh, pick up the hit templates. Uh, so this will be uh, the, some driver uh, which will be using the hit templates and these templates will be passed to the OpenStack hit and the OpenStack hit will create for us the, the cloud resources. For example, it will create for, for us the network, it will uh, create for us volumes on the storage and will pick up uh, the specific image and this image will be used by Nova to launch the Nova instance. So, and this Nova instance will be um, built from this specific image where we'll have installed already some uh, cloud init package, uh, Kubernetes or Swarm packages, we'll have the Docker package, and of course it can be also uh, delivered by uh, different um, on the do, uh, dif different operating systems. So, how does it look like uh, on a OpenStack architecture? So, uh, the Kubernetes cluster will deploy two different ty types of instances. From uh, one side, there will be um, Cube Master, which will be um, launching the uh, controller services like API server, controller manager, and scheduler. This will be, uh, these services uh, are designed to control the Q Kubernetes cluster. And we will have also the workers, uh, the minions, cube minions, which uh, will uh, host for us the containers and whole application. And at the end, when we will decide to deploy uh, the, our application, we will be able to also expose this application to the end user to the internet uh, using the OpenStack uh, Neutron Load Balancer. Why the OpenStack Magnum is so awesome? So everybody or uh, everybody can have its own uh, Kubernetes cluster. Of course, uh, the deployment will take only a few minutes. So for example, last week we had a user who tried to deploy the Kubernetes cluster manually. So it took him uh, something like seven days and we'll uh, do this in, in our demo in a couple of minutes. Of course the whole configuration will be done automatically. At the, we can auto scale our cluster, we can auto scale our uh, platform on demand and yeah we can start on this ready environment our containerized application and we can just expose it to the internet using the load balancer. Why mm, we are supposed to pick up the Magnum with Kubernetes? Of course, it's based on the mm, Google experience uh, uh, with their uh, uh, containers, running the containers in the production. Uh, once we will migrate our application to the Kubernetes manifest, we will always have this same deployment process. So, and this make our um, application really portable. We will be able always to migrate the application bef between their different clouds. We will take care only about the application. So this was uh, what we defined at the beginning. This uh, Kubernetes, of course, is ready for really big cluster uh, deployment. So it, we can just deploy hundreds or a couple thousands of, of nodes. And we can just choose between the virtual nodes and the bare metal. What well, will be the future for us as developers? So for example, we, we would like to focus and bring the, the support for uh, Kubernetes on different platforms like the ARM or S390. We'll get also auto scaling and auto restarting feature. So this, um, we would like to give our data center more um, artificial intelligence. We would like to uh, the, the make our uh, data center more autonomous, like the autom autonomous cars, which will drive us through our the um, uh, productional workloads. And we would like to also support some other containers engines. 
So this is, uh, let's sum up a li little bit. So we are thinking that the Magnum is a really big thing, which uh, currently it's making OpenStack more, uh, more complete. So we can build, for example, our own uh, li library of application. We can just launch them, we can just um, uh, manage the different projects which are aware of the containers topology. And we make the OpenStack as a first class citizen um, for container uh, technology. And this is everything. It's only to make our work easier and yeah, the better. So um, I think that yeah, right now we are ready for demo. So we would like to show you now first, we would like to start with showing the OpenStack with the Crowbar project. This is uh, what we are using for deploying um, the OpenStack. Uh, so we created some special uh, Magnum bar clamp. We, to deploy Magnum, we, we have to only drag and drop the node which we would like to deploy, uh, on which we would like to deploy the Magnum service. So right now, we are switching to Horizon and we have the ready OpenStack cloud uh, with uh, different resources. And what we will use to our demo is the Magnum slash 12 SP1 uh, based image, uh, which will be used to deploy the Kubernetes cluster. So to do this, we need to only create the Bay model, which is the, some kind of template, which is a bunch of the um, parameters, how to uh, deploy the Kubernetes. And yeah, we can also provide some options, some recipes. We have to choose the, our image. We have to choose the flavors for the minions and different flavor for minions and different flavor for master. We can just uh, provide the cinder as a backend. And we will also create some volume which will be used for our uh, containers data. Uh, to set up the network, things for uh, Kubernetes. We, we choose already the flannel as a network driver. We have to only provide the name of the external network. And for our demo, we will use also our local Docker registry, which you uh, show how we are going to use it to, to operate and yeah. So when we, once we will create the Bay model with all our parameters, we have to only click one button, which is create the bay. And in this, this, this way, we'll be ready to deploy um, Kubernetes cluster. One thing which we have to only define, it's the number of the master nodes and the minion nodes. And that's all. One click and we are <coughs> starting the um, provisioning pr process for uh, deploying the um, Kubernetes cluster. And we can go, as I said, uh, Magnum is using hit templates. So everything, our uh, deployment will be uh, shown in a um, hit stack um, tab. So we can see that, for example, hit is taking care about the deploying the whole, uh, whole Kubernetes cluster. We have all the all the bulbs, all the blobs which you can see, they are different components, uh, different uh, cloud resources, which normally you should uh, configure manually. And uh, the yeah, and the uh, heat uh, right now is uh, starting the Kubernetes master. We can just go and to check on the console uh, how this node is. Uh, how this node is booting and which services are configured and st uh, started. So right now we see that um, Kubemaster is already uh, launched and right now the cloud init service will take the data, metadata and will configure for us the uh, rest of the um, Kubernetes services uh, needed to, on the master node. So we see that there is an ATC. So uh, Flavio, do you recognize the services? Yeah, sure. So 
it's going, Heat is going to enable the services that are needed on the node, so like etcd, cube master, cube scheduler, the API controller is going to generate uh, SSH keys for, for, for the node, of course. And then once it's done with that, it's, it's going to move back to the minions, to the worker nodes, which are the nodes where we, we are supposed to, to star the containers. It's going to create them using the flavor that was specified inside of, uh, of the Bay model that we create. And again, it's going to customize everything. Yeah, so right now, the minions uh, are starting. So we decided at the beginning that we would like to have the Kubernetes cluster with two minions. So we have the two workers. So uh, we also uh, provide that we would like to get uh, two volumes uh, from which will be created from Cinder and will be mounted on the minions for the containers data. So uh, on the network topology, we can see already and check that uh, all the um, instances, they are already in the same network, uh, uh, connected together and routed to the outside world. So in this way, we can also use the um, upstream, the, the registry with the containers or something else. So one more. Mm -hmm. One more click on the console on the minion to check the status, what, what, is, uh, what is done there. We still have to wait for a cloud init, which is launching the kubelet and starting our Docker service. So now everything is operational. <clears throat> yeah. And it took us, what, three minutes? Uh, I think that even two. So, and it was done on my uh, development environment, so. Okay. So That's pretty cool. So now we can play with it, right? Yeah, I can just uh, pass the, the, the ready Kubernetes cluster to you and maybe you can just show it us something more. Yeah, so in, in the remaining part of the demo, we are just going to, to play with this Kubernetes cluster. We're going to work from a laptop, so you can just point the kubectl, which is a command line tool for Kubernetes, you can point that to your cluster by just copying the IP address which is shown into the Bay page. And now you can get information about the cluster. You can see, for example, how many nodes are part of the cluster. Yeah, like that. So we, you can see that you have to, we have two nodes running. So now we can do a deployment. So here we have some uh, Kubernetes manifests. These, these are from the, um, one of the um, quick start guides of Kubernetes. It's a guestbook application which is using Radius as a, as a database. But uh, Radius is not deployed in a simple way. It's deployed in a, in a, in a master and slave mode. So we have uh, one master. Now we are creating a, a pod running a Kubernetes master. The master uh, is going to receive all the read and write requests to the database. And then everything is going to be propagated to other two instances of Radius, which are configured to be slaves. The slaves are going to be there to, to act as a backup and also to, to, to respond to read requests. So um, the, the master is up and running. Uh, we also created a, a service. A service is one of the, um, is a way to expose uh, a, a program running inside of a container to other containers inside of the cluster. It's one of the clever ways to, uh, of Kubernetes to solve some problems like uh, uh, service discovery, how to handle multiple choices, or how to recover from failures. So now we are creating um, the, the slaves. As you can see, uh, some containers are creating. Uh, you can, it's taking some time because this is the first run. So uh, Kubernetes has to download uh, the images from the Docker registry what we are using. Now, the slave, one of the slaves is running. I think also the other one should be running. Yeah, right now we will auto-scale uh, the Redis uh, backend. Okay, so we, we yeah, we auto-scale the, 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 the replica. So, a replica set means that you want to have uh, a certain number of a certain type of container always running. So now we, we decided that one slave was not enough for us. We wanted to, to be more resistant. So we scaled the number of slave nodes from one to two. So uh, Kubernetes noticed that and it immediately started to create a new container for the slave. This time it created that on a different node because you know it's better instead of having all the, same con all the containers on the same node. 
So it created that. Another really nice thing is you can do debugging straight from your laptop. As you have seen, you can get the logs of a container. You can even um, SSH, kind of SSH into a container, all of that from your local machine. So no need to figure out which cluster, which node of the cluster is running uh, the container and then SSH into this one. Now the, what we are doing, uh, we just created the front-end controller. The front-end is the Gasbook application. We also declare that to be a public service, meaning that this time this is a service which is reachable also outside of the cluster. So um, we highlighted here a port number. So Kubernetes, as you have seen in the third slide of the presentation, Kubernetes, if you want to expose something, it will allocate a port on each node of your cluster, on each worker node of your cluster, and then you just have to uh, point your load balancer to this port number and it will work. So what we are seeing now so, yeah. is... Right now we are making the, the, our service, our application available to the internet. So we have to go back to the Neutron and create the new uh, load balancer pool. So right now we are adding the virtual IP from the um, subnet, from the Kubernetes cluster. So as you can see, we chose already port 80 because it's our web application and we would like to make it available uh, um, on the internet. So this is, this is nice, but it's um, it's quite some steps. Can we do something better? Yeah, of course. There is already some Kubernetes OpenStack uh, driver, which will take care uh, about uh, automating uh, and creating the load balancer rules um, for our cluster. So you, you just define that into your Kubernetes manifest, and then Kubernetes will go back and deal with all these manual steps for you, yep. right? So yeah, right now we added the minions to our load balancer pools as a members and we are almost ready and we are done with our uh, de uh, whole deployment and we can just go and check the status of our uh, web application uh, containers and yeah, we can just try to access the application. So yeah, they are up and running and we can go to the, our uh, browser and to type the domain name and yeah we are done yeah so everything is working now we are entering <coughs> messages into the guest book which is storing everything into into redis but what if we want to do a further iteration on the development of this application like we want to change a bit the graphic is there somehow something that can help us with Kubernetes? Yeah, Kubernetes has uh, uh, many different tools. So maybe we would like to rebuild once again our web application and to upload it to the cluster. Yeah, so now what we are going to do, we are editing the HTML file of this web application. We are introducing some, some new graphics in, inside of it. Then we are going to uh, rebuild this Docker image with a traditional Docker build command. And after that, we're going to push the image to our registry. But then we have the problem of performing the deployment. So um, we could uh, just uh, shut down everything and move to the new application, or we can do something cooler. So what we're going to do is to use the Kubernetes deployment feature, which allows you to do a, a blue-green deployment. So it will start a rolling update of your application. So uh, in production now, we're going to deploy a new pod uh, running the new version of the image. As soon as the new pod is up and running and is behaving correctly, then Kubernetes will remove one of the pods running the old application and it will keep adding a new, a new pod running the new application and then removing an old pod running the old application until you're just running instances of the new application. In the meantime, production is up and running. If you notice, we just did a reload and uh, uh, we, we were as accidentally redirected to one of the pods running the new application, so we, we saw uh, the nice logo in there. But this is really nice because there is no downtime there. If something goes wrong, you can always roll back, and everything is built into Kubernetes. Yep. Um, yeah, exactly. So uh, 
this is why we are thinking that this is really a perfect uh, tool for uh, developers and also to use on the um, product production environment. So it has many good features. So right now you can see that some of the requests uh, which we, when we try to re uh, refresh the, our browser, some of the requests, they are still going to the old version of our application and the then the, 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 some others will go to the new version. This is because we just pick up the round robin um, algorithm for our load balancer. And what is going right now? So right now you can see that one instance is terminating. This is an instance of a pod which is running the old code. So Kubernetes is getting rid of it. And now all the production is running with a new version of the code. So this. Yeah, at the, for example, when you decide that you would, like, you would like to get the rollback because there are still some bugs, you can still make the rollback from your, to the previous version of your application and it will be also fully automated and it will be almost uh, mm, yeah, uh, not uh, seen by the end user. Mm -hmm. okay. and the, the one thing that we just made the uh, rolling update, and you can see that the, the backend data, they, they stayed always the same. So it means that the backend was uh, preserved and was always untouched, you know. So the, all the backend data will, was saved and uh, still kept in the consistent uh, state. Okay, so I would say that the key points of this talk are that Kubernetes can really help you with your development. Um, setting up Kubernetes is not so easy. You can really leverage a Magnum in there to simplify everything. At the same time with Magnum, you can satisfy the requests of the different people inside of your organization. So if multiple tenants want to have their own Kubernetes cluster, this is really simple to do with, uh, with OpenStack and with Magnum. And in the future, there are going to be really, really cool integration between the two of them. So, as I said in the beginning, Kubernetes can automatically scale out when you have a certain traffic spikes, but what happens when you saturate your Kubernetes cluster? There's no more room, okay? They, there, now there is the integration, there is going to be the integration with OpenStack, so you, once Kubernetes is, is maxed out, you can scale out the underlying platform, so you can add up new worker nodes, that can be joining the cluster and then Kubernetes can start to allocate new pods on top of them. And when everything is over, you can just scale down to consume less resources. Yeah, and yeah, I, I believe that we at least try to show, to show that uh, the, this two combination that from the one side we have the uh, framework for uh, managing our infrastructure and from the other side we have the perfect platform for orchestrating our application and these two um, Technologies, these two tools together, they are just creating perfect fit, you know, for the end users. And yeah, that's all. That's all. So we manage to fill in time. So for some questions, so yeah. if you have any question. Um, there was a microphone somewhere. Uh, microphone. Oh, uh, nice, nice demo. Thank you very much for that. Um, what release of Magnum are you using? It looks like you're running Mataka in there. Mm, yeah, this is right. So the demo was uh, prepared on a Mitaka version, but uh, in, after the summit we are switching to Newton. So, okay, no, so no worries. Just a quick remark here. There's some key differences in Magnum in the Newton release. Bays are not called bays anymore. They're just called clusters. So everywhere that you saw Bay in this presentation, as of the new, of, of the Newton release, it's just called a cluster. Yeah, we know about this, and yeah, we we just we were also a little bit concerned about how to uh, name these two things in our presentation. Uh, yeah, so but they are we are calling right now the um, Bay as a Kubernetes cluster as a cluster. So thank you for the comment. A question about Magnum. Mm -hmm. uh, can you span workers across regions? So mm -hmm. for, to do that, uh, I'm not a Magnum expert. Uh, Kubernetes has this project that was initially called Ubernetes, mm -hmm. which is about federated deployments of Kubernetes. This is something which is still in progress inside of Kubernetes upstream. 
Uh, I wouldn't define that as production ready, so I think that Magnum has to wait a bit. Maybe they can start to experiment with that, but I wouldn't consider that production yeah, ready. Yeah, but I yet. thought Magnum could solve that problem with load balancing and things in the OpenStack environment, perhaps. <laughs> Yeah, when I talk about the federated deployment, I mean to have something like a, a Kubernetes cluster, so with its own master mm -hmm. in one region, and then another Kubernetes cluster with its mm -hmm. own master in another region. The load balancer you see in there is used to expose services which are running inside of it. When you, when you want to have a federated Kubernetes cluster, you want to put in touch different workers together to, to address scheduling between different mm -hmm. workers. So. Okay, there was also some question. Would you like to go to make microphone? It's for the recording. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. That was really interesting. I'm wondering how we're dealing with the security. For example, can I enforce security groups on firewalls on a containers mm. level? Something like that. So um, Kubernetes has become set of uh, network security policies. So you can define, for example, that certain containers are not allowed to talk with other containers. This is a new feature uh, of Kubernetes, which is not supported by all the different network drivers. So for example, Calico network driver can do that so far. I don't know if there is any integration between OpenStack and, uh, and Kubernetes, but I would go that direction. Thank you. And from an OpenStack uh, side, uh, of course, uh, when we are deploying the Kubernetes cluster, we, there, there are created some security groups which are assigned to the uh, Kubernetes master nodes and the Kubernetes minions. Do you guys also handle upgrading the Kubernetes itself? When the new version of Kubernetes releases, like if you have already deployed one cluster, everything's working great, but how do you handle that? Okay. So, but maybe could you give me like out a workflow of what exactly how that may look like? Oh, okay. It all depends. Yes. Yeah, starting from version 1.4, it's possible to do this self upgrade of Kubernetes. A lot, a lot depends on how you actually deploy Kubernetes itself. We are work in progress upstream to do a Kubernetes deployment through Kubernetes itself. Yeah. <laughs> Inception. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, yeah, there is work in progress, but something is already possible right now. But will Magnum, for example, help with that? I mean, so essentially, I understand that Kubernetes, after a certain release, they're, they're planning on, you know, uh, they, they do support the in-place upgrade, but is Magnum mm -hmm. going to provide, a, because since f for an end user, they're just using Magnum, they're not directly installing Kubernetes ever. Mm -hmm. So for them, the installation of Kubernetes and setting it up is completely opaque. They don't yeah. know it. All right, thank you. <laughs> okay, so. Yeah, the last question related to uh, the opportunity to link resources hosted on OpenStack on a Nova instance with Kubernetes and containers. Do you need to rely on floating IPs to connect together uh, those resources? How do you do to, uh, what, what is the deployment pattern to, to deal with that? I, I didn't get what resources do you want you, to you have together? resources for instance you have a database running in a virtual machine mm -hmm. and a typical application running running in a container how mm -hmm. do you do to deal with uh, connection mm -hmm. uh, so during the deployment uh, we can, you can specify the network configuration and I don't think there's nothing you, you have to do special because, I mean, from the container that can access other machines which are inside of, a, of the OpenStack cluster, OpenStack installation. So if you have a virtual machine deployed on top of OpenStack with its own IP address and database running inside of it, you can access that from the containers. The containers have also separated network for their own special purposes, but this doesn't relate in this case. So there's no need to have an elastic IP. I had a quick question. Uh, is uh, Mirano, I mean, restricted to running, I mean, bringing up Kubernetes clusters only in v VMs today? Is that right? Like, can I bring up Kube masters and Kube minions on actual biometers themselves okay. instead of bringing them up in VMs? Uh, 
Can you do bare metal deployments? That's the question. Yes, you can do the bare metal deployment, but we have to a little bit improve it. Okay, and the second part question is that if I'm bringing up minions, uh, is there a way I can specify different uh, plugins? Like, if I want to use a specific CNI plugin, can I configure it? No? Oh, you mean, okay. Um, okay, in our case, we decided to use Flannel. So we, we bundle everything to work with Flannel. Um, the question is, can you use different uh, types of uh, networking and choose them from, uh, from Magnum? Uh, so the bay. Yeah, right now we are supporting or just we implemented Flannel as a network driver, uh, but we are open for the, our users' voices. So, all right, thanks. I'm looking at him. I guess you are a Magnum developer, not knock. Yeah, I, I think the question is the answer is yes, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's pluggable. Okay. Yep. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.